Welcome to part 11 of this video series. Today we're going to be discussing dinghies and yacht tenders for your small level board boat. And thank you for your support in making these videos. And if you haven't done so already, please remember to like and subscribe. Okay, so the only time I can imagine not needing a dinghy is if you only stay in marinas or yacht clubs. But personally, not being able to experience the joy of spending a night in a quiet spot at anchor would be a real loss. Plus, it really can cut the cost of boat living or even cruising. And if you are going to spend any time at anchor, then a dinghy is a necessity. They are your link to land. I have heard some people refer to the dinghy as the equivalent of a car for a homeowner, but I don't think that's quite accurate because you still need to get around once on shore. In fact, I'm going to be doing another video on shore transportation, the alternative to autos for liveaboards, later in this series. Since this video is on small boats, I won't look at large yacht tenders, but instead at more compact dinghies. What type of dinghy really depends on what you need it for. Before you decide on what type of dinghy you need, you have to figure out what you're going to be using it for. For example, if you're staying in one anchorage full time on a mooring buoy, then size isn't much of a concern, because you can just use a painter and keep the dinghy floating beside you. When you leave your mooring, you can just attach the dinghy to the buoy and leave it there. But for the rest of us who travel long distances or spend a, long, a large amount of time at anchor, a compact dinghy is a necessity. I had read once about a sailor who said he just swims back and forth with a waterproof bag. But to me that sounds awful. Water is quite often cold, and how many provisions really can you fit in a waterproof bag? As for size, it would be great if we could anchor in small bay where the shore is not far and you don't have to worry about wind and waves. But that's just not reality especially if you travel long distances. Then you have to contend with things like large mooring fields where it can be quite a ways to shore in less than ideal water conditions. So as far as size, the simple answer is as large as you can comfortably carry with you. The larger the dinghy, the more people and provisions and the rougher water you can handle. Now, as for rowing or powering, rowing is much simpler. There is nothing to break down, no fuel to buy, and they're much lighter and cheaper to buy or replace if they're stolen. However, having said that, some of us are not as young as we once were, and rowing through strong headwinds to a distant shore can just be a little bit too much. Plus, if you're the type who loves to use their dinghy to go exploring up rivers, etc., then you're going to want to have an electric motor or gas engine. Storing an engine while it's still attached to the dinghy in most small liveaboard boats is nearly impossible so you need to have find a safe and convenient way to remove the engine and store it. Sailboats do have a small advantage here. They can simply use their boom as a crane and lift it off. Motorboats, however, can install small actual cranes to help with this process. Now, as for the actual type of dinghies, there's quite a selection from fully inflatable to ribs, from fully rigid to nesting to folding, and everything in between. Let's start with inflatables. For the most part, inflatables can hold more and are more stable than rigid type of dinghies. However, because of their flat bottoms, they don't row very well at all. And if you cannot store them on board, they don't tow very well at all. Only some types can handle having an engine mounted on them. However, some can have special mounts mounted to them aftermarket. Inflatables can be a real royal pain to inflate and deflate. So even if you do end up using one, you should always try to find a way to store it on board while it's still inflated. Inflatables come in many price ranges from very cheap to very, very expensive. But this is one case where you truly do get what you pay for. Cheap inflatables don't hold air very well. They puncture much more easily and are not stiff, not as stiff as the better quality ones. One hint though, if you are planning on using a less expensive inflatable, is to put a piece of plywood on the bottom. It makes it a lot more functional. Run duct tape along the edges of the wood so it doesn't rub holes into the material. Ribs are very common on cruising boats. RIB stands for Rigid Inflatable Boats, and they offer the best of both worlds, rigid and inflatable. However, the smaller ones are usually just an inflatable dinghy with a solid floor. Some small ones do have a form of inflatable keels, but most ribs are larger and really won't fit onto small liveaboard boats, so I'm not really going to talk much about those today. Some form of purely rigid dinghy is normally the most practical for small boat liveaboards. They are normally hassle-free and can be much, much lighter than inflatables. They are much more abrasion resistant than inflatables, so you don't have to worry about dragging them up on the beach. In fact, some come with a wheel in the rear to make moving them across ground much more easy. 
Almost all rigids can handle a small engine. The problem with all dinghies on small liveaboard boats is where to store them. As I mentioned before, towing a dinghy is an option a lot of people do, even though it has its issues. If you're under power, it can decrease your fuel economy. You have to pull it in tight and control it every time you pull into a marina, etc. A lot of marinas, locks, etc. charge by the foot and can charge you for the length of the dinghy. In fact, some marinas and locks, like the Rita Waterway by me, will charge you for two boats with a minimum of 20 feet. So you'll be paying for your own boat plus another 20 foot boat. One more issue is, I have a friend who was crossing Lake Ontario and got caught in a storm, which quickly swamped the dinghy and sank it, pulling it down on the main boat. He had no choice but to cut it loose and let it sink. Really expensive. Being able to keep the boat on deck would be the best idea. However, it's also the hardest to do on a small boat. There are nesting boats that can fit in a smaller space or folding boats that can tie up along your lifelines. And as much as I love the idea of these, folding them while actually on your boat can be a real challenge. Also, trying to put them on the deck can be a real issue. If your boat has enough buoyancy aft and you have a wide enough transom, you might be able to hang a dinghy on davits. The advantage of this is the dinghy isn't dragging behind you and it's not taking up any deck space. You also don't have to worry about the challenge of getting your dinghy up and onto the deck. Personally, I think this is the best way to go if your boat can support it. The downside is a lot of marinas, etc. will charge you the, for the extra length it gives your boat. But remember, it's now the width of your dinghy and not the length. Also, having a weight hanging off your stern can be a liability in a storm. I'm currently designing and building a new dinghy for myself. It will be a nesting dinghy that will hang in a set of pivoting davits. The reason I want it to be nesting is I spend 90% of my time in protected water, but it's when I do crossings, the other 10%, I would like to have my dinghy secured on deck. Also, if I plan on being in a marina for a longer length of time, I can put it on deck and pivot the davits to save money. I'm also planning on having a solid locking compartment on the dinghy where I could store my electric motor for it. Speaking of locking up the motor, dinghy security can be a large issue. What I use for locking my dinghy is a 25 foot length of strong cable permanently attached to the dinghy with one foot length of chain on the far end, plus a strong padlock. The reason for the length is quite often I just dinghy up to a beach and it can be quite a ways to reach a tree to lock it up. The reason for the chain at the end is so I can wrap it around the bottom of a bollard and lock it tight so it can't be pulled up over the tines. If you use oars, just get a security device to lock them up. And you can get a lock for your motor, however make sure it's a good one. Don't just use a padlock, I've seen many of these just cut. In closing. I have seen lots of people use stand-up paddle boards, kayaks, etc. as a dinghy. But the problem with those is there's no space for passengers or provisions and they're hard to lock up on shore. Use a real dinghy and you'll be a lot happier. Thank you again for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video series on living on a small boat. If you have then, please subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. Thank you.